Welcome to My Life, the Supplied, episode 403. We are in the month of Ir, getting closer as we count the Omer countdown toward Matan Teda, which is uh, the holiday of Shavuos, which will be in two weeks from today. So we'll continue talking about that theme and many others. This program is dedicated in merit of Baruch Ben Yom and Ben Menuch Elena and Miriam Bas Chayes Sara Altoiz, Yukusil Ben Leir Rochel and Rochel Bas Liba Farkas, and dedicated by Pinchas Todes Ben Miriam and Sara Bas Rochel Altoiz. So let's begin with the Parsha of this week, Parsha B'Chukoyse, which is the last Parsha in the third book of uh, by Yikra, Leviticus. And there are many lessons to be learned from it, and the words learned from it, and the words of the Alter Rebbe, you have to live with the times. The expression that the Rebbe so often cited, Teter Melosh and Heira, Teter is from the word direction, guidance, essentially being that the Teter is life's operator's manual, a blueprint for existence. So in it we find directives for existence, direction of how to live our lives. So briefly, this year, outside of Eretz Yisrael, we read Parsha B'chul Kaysay. <coughs> and often, these two chapters, the previous chapter, Bahar and B'chul Kaysay, come together, but this year it's separate. In B'chul Kaysay Telechu, when you will follow my edicts, my laws, v'nesati gishmechem bi'item. I will give you the reins, and gishmechem also means gashmis. I will bless you with all the material things you need, and it's time. Not just that we're blessed with it, but it's also important timing. In a time of uh, one time, you may need a certain blessing, another time, a different type of blessing. Which is the essence, really, of uh, understanding Torah and Judaism that is cause and effect. It's not just a reward that's unrelated to the actions that you did. A child goes to school, for example, and does well. The parents, the educators, will give them a candy. The candy has nothing to do with the good learning they did or the good behavior. When it comes in Torah, however, because as I said, it's a blueprint for life, when a person follows these laws, and the laws are not just laws, they are essentially aligning ourselves to be the best possible beings we can be and to live our best possible lives. Think of a machine that's following the guidelines of, its, of, the, of the operator's manual as designed by the engineer, so then the reward is the thing itself, schar mitzvah mitzvah. The mitzvah itself is giving you the reward because it's rewarding you to be the healthiest you can possibly be. So the Torah is saying that when a person aligns themselves to what's expected of us, what's, what we're obligated to do, we actually, that's what brings blessings to the life. It's like when a person is going to be kind, it's not just, you get an, you're just to get another reward. When you're kind, you actually become a better person. So ultimately, that's all part of the reward as in cause and effect. So that's a general statement. B'chukkaisei also comes from the word, we know there's in mitzvahs, there's, to, there's uh, mishpatim, edus chukim. Mishpatim are the rational laws. Edus are the commemorative ones. Rational laws would be like do not steal, do not kill, or positive ones like giving uh, charity, inviting guests. The edus are commemorative like Shabbos, Yom Tif, and the third, chukim, are considered the super rational ones, that humans would never have come up with it on their own. But chukesai emphasizes the third type, even though in truth, every one of them encompasses all three. But when you break it down, chukesai is also from that element of chuka. But there's another expression, chuka also comes from the word chekika, engraved, chuka chakakti gzeda gazarti. So it's an engraved because even though all the laws are mitzvahs from the word connections. As I said, you're connecting to your soul, you're connecting to your purpose, you're connecting to the divine plan for which you were created when a person follows these laws. But where do you see most the being the engraved element is when it's coming from logic or even commemorative laws which make sense. <clears throat> there you could say maybe part of it is also our own initiative, which is a beautiful thing. But when you want something engraved through and through that, it's like, a, who are you? You see that most in the super rational laws. Because there, it's only coming from the cosmic engineer, God. 
But at the same time, we're told that all mitzvahs have to be done like chukim, and all mitzvahs have to be done like mishpatim, which means even the rational laws also need to have that element of being engraved through and through and doing it for a super rational reason, meaning not just because it makes sense, but because this is what God the Creator told us we need to do because that's the best way we can live our lives and aligns existence to the purpose of existence. And the same thing, the super rational also, we try to find some explanation and meaning, even though fundamentally it's higher than reason. Because the same God that is beyond reason also said, I want to manifest things in reason. That's why you'll find in, in the Rambam, the end of Hilchus Me'ila, the end of Hilchus Tmura, where he talks about that even the laws that seemingly don't have a basis in logic, based on, it's based on God's will, and yet we try to find all the time reasons and ways to apply it to our lives and show how it refines our life, which indeed is the case. It's also interesting in Chilkesei Teilechu, the word Teilechu, the emphasis being Halicha, that not just we perform the mitzvahs, but we grow through them, we elevate through them. It's a journey in life. It says, Halichus Elam Loi, Al Tikra Halichus Ella Halachis, that most people would think Halichus means movement, Halachis means laws. You think laws are rigid and set in stone, etched in stone. And yet, halachas comes from the word halicha. And as the Shalosh says, when you say al tikra, it means it's in addition to. Meaning it has both meanings. Because even though halacha does have a certain element of firmness, this is the law and you can't waver from it. But the purpose of it is not, is not to be frozen. The purpose is growth. That's why halacha itself grows. As long as it's within the framework, you see that in di- different generations, different halachas, more nuances are expressed because it's part of a journey, the journey of Teda, as long as it's based on the foundations. So, so like a tree, a tree has deep roots, but at the same time it grows. So we're not talking about changing the roots, God forbid, but we're talking about a growth that's based on it. It's a fascinating point because many people think, look at halacha as constraints, when in truth... It's all about movement and growth, and it's made to, for us to grow. Halach is not made to keep us in a box to conform to a certain particular rigid approach. It's meant to help us grow. Just like the roots of a tree are not meant to keep the tree here and not make it move, but allow it to have the foundation upon which you can then build and spread your wings and like the branches of a tree and the sky being the limit and beyond of growth. Some lessons from Bechukesi Telecho, which are critical. Today's day and age, very often those growing up in, in an observant home or community, so often the trap is that people just become cultural Jews, which means mechanical, mitzvah sa'anoshim alamada, just following mechanics robotically, and lacking the Telecho. So they have the Chekika part, that it's engraved and it's unwavering, but you need sometimes that Telecho. While at the same time, as much as we move, we also need to be grounded. Just like think of musical notes. There's only seven musical notes on the scale. And yet, and only that many keys on a piano or, uh, or strings on a violin or other instruments, each have their structure. And yet, those same musical notes create magic. You'll say, one second, it's a structured note. You can only play it a certain way. Sounds have their limits. They have their bandwidth, so to speak. And yet... You can play something in so many infinite different ways, even the same song, that allow a, soar, a soul to soar to another time and place. So the same structure allows us to transcend structure. That's the ultimate. In the chapter, we have different themes, including some of the negative expressions that seem to sound like techecha, which is like clawless curses. And yet, as the al Rebbe explains in the Kutateira, Ampachu Kesei, the same as it's explained in Pasha Kisove and other places in the Torah, that the truth is the deepest chesodim, the deepest love, the deepest blessings are concealed in these seemingly kololos. And it's also connected to Rashbi and Rabbi Lozer, we're coming from Lagba Emer, where, where Rabbi Shimon Rabbi sent his son Rabbi Lozer to get blessings from the sages. And instead, it seemed to Rabbi Lozer that they cursed him. And he came back to Rabbi Shbi all appalled. Rashbi said, no, but emes brachas ninhu, they're really blessings. And he explains how the expressions that they used were all blessings. We've discussed in the past, so why didn't they say it as blessings? One of the deeper reasons is because 
they wanted to actually give him greater blessings, and the greatest blessings are concealed sometimes in containers that sound the opposite, because that allows you to express something that you could not express in chesodim gluim and regular chesodim have their regular channels and containers. But chesodim mechusim, deeper, more concealed kindness and love and blessings, can only be expressed sometimes through opposite, through the opposite language, as discussed in Lakut Teteri B'chukosai with the Tzemach Tzedek's Hagar there, where he connects it to the Gemara Moed Cotton, that talks about this story. So there we have lesson as well that even the negative things in your life, even though at the moment they ostensibly seem to be negative, and we always pray for only positive things, but if something does happen after the fact, know that it always contains and carries tremendous potency for your growth and for your ability to move forward and grow in your life. Okay. A few other questions that came in on this chapter. Is Hashem breaking His promise to us every day Mashiach doesn't come? And more detail, dear Rabbi Jacobson, in Parshish B'chukese, Hashem promises many blessings to us if we follow the Torah, as we discussed, cause and effect. But also the opposite of blessings, if we don't follow the Torah, also cause and effect. When you use a machine not aligned to the way the engineer, in this case the cosmic engineer built it, you cause, you cause damage to it, God forbid. But Hashem also promises that if we don't do the right thing and end up in exile, that He will never break His promises to us or His covenant with Avram. One of Hashem's promises that, is, it promises is that Mashiach will come and usher in an era of peace and prosperity. Every day that Mashiach doesn't come, Hashem is technically breaking His promise. How do we reconcile this? I hereby declare that since Hashem made those promises, that He must keep them, and therefore Mashiach must come today. Amen. Amen. Well, what you're saying echoes very much the Rebbe in so many sikhs, where he would do the same as other tzaddikim over the generations. They would cite from the Torah itself proof that God has to fulfill what He Himself commands. So that your question is a very legitimate one. And as it is with other things, the Rebbe has a beautiful sikha, for example. It says, Loisolin schar, that you should not, when, you, when someone comes to work for you, an employer hires an employee. So you're supposed to pay them, and Loisol, not overnight, not the next day. You have to pay them at the end of the day of their work. Since Abishtuk fulfills all the mitzvahs he gives us, so day and night is like after the day of work, which means we're working. So the Abishtuk is supposed to give us schar. And the ultimate schar is Mashiach. So that's our psach aloche. And the conclusion is, yes, we have that complaint. We have that ability to demand. Obviously with the proper respect. And so we have to tackle these questions. So God does not break his promise. Absolutely not. And there are different explanations why the delay, because Hashem also said, I made some conditions. But as the Rebbe explains, we've already fulfilled all those conditions all the different deadlines have been met to bring the, for the Gula, for, for them, redemption. And the only thing dependent on is now Tshuva. And Tshuva we also did as the Rebbe and the Rabbein before Paskind. So now we have the question. We have a question, as the Rebbe said a number of times, especially in the later years, 1989, 1990, 91, 92. He said, so why did Mashiach not come? Takakasha. He has Takakasha. It's a question. So we continue to do what we must do, because obviously that is a requirement. But at the same time, we absolutely can expect and even demand and say, Hashem, in your tailor, not just don't do it for me, do it for you. Remember, the goal is not just for our benefits, for the benefit of Shkinta Begalusa as well, that the divine should ultimately be revealed in this material world. So fine. So this Pasuk has. These promises only add to our ability to do, say, we do our part, and we did our part, and we want you now to do your part. And may it happen immediately, as you say. <clears throat> In this Pasha, even though the mitzvah of Maisa is mentioned in many places, and more at length later in Bamidbar, but is tithing giving Maisa just like paying taxes? Were there accountants and lawyers during the time of the Beis Amigdash, the temple, who helped people who help people figure out how to lawfully find deductions and pay the least amount of maizah. Well, I wouldn't say it's exactly like taxes. First of all, taxes are paid to a man-made government. 
for practical purposes. The government provides services and has expenses. And since we're benefiting from these services, so there's a certain give and take. When it comes to Meiser, yes, there is that element that God gave you life and God gives you sustenance and prosperity. So therefore, Meiser seems to be, is, not just seems to be, is the obligation to return a tenth. Meiser, you tithe. So there is, of course, that basic answer. But here we're dealing not with a, a man-made government, which can have its flaws, and even their tax laws are not, not always uh, exactly fair, and may, uh, may, be, may, may uh, lean toward the benefit of some and not others. And there's plenty of manipulation, obviously, as we know. You know, loopholes, then loopholes are closed. The same lawyers who create the loopholes then are hired by the government to close the loopholes and then are hired for more money by, the, by companies and by individuals to find, find new loopholes. And the Torah, on the other hand, my said, as I said before about mitzvahs in general, is not just a, uh, a man-made negotiation. You give me, I give you. There's also, it's also the, a mitzvah that is best for us. When a person gives, it says when he gives, it's actually a keli for blessings. Because giving makes us healthier people, better people. So my sir is not just the obligation, you were blessed, so return. It's also giving you perhaps even more, yesen masha'ani, the Kabul, more than the pauper receives from the usher, from the wealthy one, the usher receives from the ani. Not necessarily in monetary terms, but a, a deeper richness, the, the gift of giving, chesed ve'emes ma'in who will do chesed, the power of chesed, which is one of our own faculties. It's like, it's like exercising the muscle of chesed in your psyche, in your soul. So that's a key thing. Whether there were those that tried to find ways if it was a, a piyalacha allowed, I'm sure there was that element. I think I remember in the Gemara it does talk about different ways that people did the calculations. Um, but still, it has to be within the Torah context. And remember, there was also those that went to Chemish and they give 20%, a fifth. So you also have the other direction. Then it says, Al Yivaz Adam Chemish. A person should certain splurge more than, more than, a, more than a fifth. 20%. But even then, if it's Negei Benafshe, meaning it's Negei to his life, even then, as the Alta Rebbe brings in Tanya in two places, they call Hashem La'odam Yitn Ba'ad Nafshe. A person will give everything to save a life, his life, his family's life. But that's a digression somewhat. Point being is that it also works the other way around, especially if you want to have the blessings, the more the keli you make, the more the blessings shower upon you. Okay, so with that, we covered some themes of, of this week's chapter. And I want to move to another uh, uh, um, discussion on the Indian of tefillah in general. And especially, tefillah is connected to Shvira Sa'imer. So, let's begin with tefillah in general. It's a general topic. And the qu- different questions came in on this topic. As I said, I consolidate questions very often to cover them all in one or a few pro- programs. And here's a good opportunity to uh, do a, an announcement. A, uh, and that is that this is Chassidus applied every week, 8 to 9 p.m. If you're the first time you're here, welcome. We have a website called chassidusapplied.com where you can f- submit any question anonymously, entirely anonymously. No questions are off limits. This is the theme of this program. Now, in its ninth year, we're already programmed at uh, episode 403. And uh, supply.com you can submit any question. There are many questions, so there is a little backup. But what I try to do, as I just mentioned, consolidate. You also can find all the previous episodes there. They're all time-stamped, which means you can f- go down below in the description and see the topic and go straight to the top where you press on the button. It'll take you straight to the topic so you don't have to listen to the whole program. Obviously, it won't bother me if you do listen to the entire program, but just to make it easier. There you can also find other resources, including the essays and creative submissions of the previous years, where people from all walks of life submitted essays and creative presentations applying chassidus to our, a contemporary challenge or issue in life, as well as other resources, including the classes I give 
I give a daily class in Ayin Bays every day of the week, um, which you can participate in. It's a live Zoom and YouTube, as well as archived. And you can find that all of that on chassidusupply.com. And finally, last year I began a weekly Saturday night Mitzray Shabbos class on Tanya called Tanya Applied. And that is also can be found at chassidusupplied.com website. So with that, let us go to the topic of tefillah prayer. Someone writes the following. How can we assure that our prayers get answered? I once complained to a rabbi that my, pray- my prayers were ineffective and had no obvious physical results. He replied that God hears all prayers and every prayer opens a door, but sometimes there are many doors, etc. I've, I've discussed this a number of times. That the Shalom writes that very clearly. Anyway, the writer continues. Months later, the rabbi asked me why I don't keep Shabbos. I replied, every time you or Hashem ask me to keep Shabbos, it opens a door, but there are many doors. See what I'm doing here? Two can play the game. Okay, as I said, I always read this without any censorship, unless something is really very offensive and just inappropriate completely. Even then, I've been known to to cross some lines. But, um, so I'm just apologizing if anybody sees this as disrespectful. But this is the voice of somebody's writing. So, we'll we'll discuss again this uh, tit-for-tat thing in a moment. My question for Rabbi Jacobson is what can we do to open all the doors that need to be opened? Including the gates, the fences, the deadlock, deadbolt locks, the deadbolt locks, the chains, the barbed wire, and the special forces, green berets of the Sitra Acher that swing flaming hockey sticks to block our prayers from entering Gan Eden and, redire- and redirect them to the cesspools of Gehenna, rendering them useless and inoperable. Wow. That's a very nice little poetic uh, flair there. Is there a super prayer that works as a master key that opens all locks and doors and rings directly to Hashem's special red phone that he keeps next to his favorite throne? And finally, this is the connection to Amos for the same. Perhaps it is the Anabekayach prayer, which alludes to a secret 42-letter name of God. The Anabekayach prayer is inserted in the Siddur to be said following counting the Omer, among other places, I should add. What is, its con- what is its connection to the Omer? Thank you. And not only should you have a nice day, but you should have nine, 49 nice days in a row. And I will add that it be all days in, in a row, to you and to everyone. So I find this an interesting little note, because on one hand, it seems very irreverent about keeping Shabbos. On the other hand, is a full de- knows all the details of Shem Mab, the name of 42, the, the, the secret of the 42 letters, name of God, and writes about uh, asking how can we assure that all the doors are opened in prayers. So I'm glad to hear that part. Let me just address the beginning here. Even though, yes, it seems to be, you know, since God is not opening all his doors when I pray to him, so therefore I also don't have to open all my doors to things that God asks of me. So I don't know if I would equate the two. Even though we, we, there's a relationship and a partnership but in many ways, we need God more than he may need us. For blessings, for health, for life in general. I mean, every moment you're alive is a blessing from God. And all the gifts that we have in life. Now, that doesn't mean God did not ask us to do certain things. And therefore, in a sense, is asking because in a way we fulfill God's mandate and God's purpose in existence. But I would just be careful in that type of equation. And therefore... When we say that God, every door, a door gets open with every prayer, that's a fact. To say that by you, you're looking for excuse and say, okay, you know what, you opened the door by asking me to keep Shabbos, but it hasn't opened all the doors. You know, you could be it's being cute, or you're actually just wrong. Is it actually opening doors? So I just, I know it was said as tongue-in-cheek, but I just wanted to comment on that. As far as the very, the very um, topic itself, there's no question that tefillah prayer is one of the fundamentals in Yiddishkeit, one of the three pillars. And we're told to pray to Hashem, especially when we're in need. Now, if you believe in a God, and I say if only if someone's coming from a skeptical point of view, of course God hears every prayer. What else is he doing? And he can't be distracted and he can multitask, so to speak. It's God. And God also wants our good. He wouldn't have created existence. Why would he create existence? Give us life. 
give us such beauty and gifts if you didn't want our good. The fact that you see painful situations or people who are struggling, so that's a discussion and, and, and a, a deserved discussion to understand how a good God would allow that. But that's not the point right now. So, the, so there's no question that when you pray to Hashem for whatever it is that you need, even for things that are beyond needs, for, for things that are extra gifts and prosperity, that God listens and why not answer? That's why we say that opens a door. It's not just a, a nice statement. It's because every prayer has an answer. Now, the fact is we live in a material world and there are layers. The divine is concealed and that's why sometimes it doesn't appear immediately. And we have to break through more layers. Those layers could be things we did in our lives that block the blessing sometimes or collectively that all of us or generationally. Due to our iniquities, which means our displacement, our disconnecting ourselves from the grand plan, like I said, disaligning ourselves. So the machine is not completely aligned in humming along and, and seamlessly channeling God's blessings. That's why we need more prayers. We need to break through. The Moshe Rabbeinu, two tovkuf tezvav eschanon, 515 prayers, and then Hashem told him finally to stop. So you can't say it was a waste, God forbid. Every prayer opened another door and changed reality till this very day. So that's, that's that. Now, is there a secret prayer that you just, like, like you said, a, a, good, a good analogy, a master key? It opens all locks. Well, we say, the gates of tears are never sealed, which means that tears can break through anything. Sincerity. So we have certain features and even certain prayers that do have a certain power like that. But you'll say, one second, but people have cried. They've said, Tehillim, for example, is also a secret book with a secret power. You see how much Tehillim is said, and especially in a time of need. And yet you'll say, one second, look at people saying Tehillim, so much Tehillim, and then a tragedy strikes anyway. So again, this does not mean it was in vain. It just meant that open doors, and God has the ability to say no, or no right now, and it'll happen in time. We don't know the grand plan. We have to do what we have to do. And we can't stop doing that. So Tehillim, tears, sincerity. Rachmona Liba boy, God wants Liba, your heart. These things are part of the keys that we were told. Yud Gimel Midas Harachimim. Hashem reveals that secret when Moshe Rabbeinu is praying for the forgiveness of the Jewish people after they build the golden calf. So all these are actually powers, divine keys that we were given to open up doors. And yes, Onur Bukayach is one of them. And as you see, when you see in the Siddur, at least many Siddurim, they have the acronym, Onur Bukayach, so it says, those are the letters, as you correctly indicated, they add up, the Onur Bukayach consists of seven lines, each line has six words, seven times six is 42. So it's the power of invoking the name of God, the 42 letters. Shem Mab, it's called. Mab, Membez, 42. And 42 has particular power. One application of it, just briefly, 6 times 7. What do we all know 6 times 7? Seven are the seven emotions. Chesed, Gvura, Teferes, Netzach, Hoyd, Yisoyed, Malchus. 6 is the 6 emotions within that. The Chesed within Chesed, the Malchus. The Gvura within Chesed, all the way to Yesoid within Chesed. We'll soon discuss why you don't count Malchus. That's 42. So when we, when we say Anabakayach, the Kavona that we have, and the Kisve Arizal in many places, and as well, talks about how these words, how this particular prayer has a particular power to bring, draw down from the channels. Remember, the 6 times 7, 42 are the channels that bring all blessings and answers to all our needs. We'll discuss shortly why we say during the counting of the Omer, among other times. Now, why is it six times seven? Well, let's compare it. There's also seven times seven, the 49 days of the Omer. When we say the six times seven prayer on the Bechayach, the Alter Rebbe in the Kut the Masay explains why the Masois, which is also 42, the 42 journeys that the people, the Jewish people took through the wilderness were 42, not 49. He explains it six times seven. The same thing was the refinement of all the seven times six emotions. But he explains 
that there, because Malchus sometimes is not counted, it's counted as the seven, but not in the six, because once you have the other six, once you have the six till you saw it, within the seven, Malchus already automatically is refined. So then why in the counting of Omer you have to count it? Because there are, there's an Aveda when it comes to Momata Lamaila. When you have to work on yourself, then you have to work even on the Malchus within the Malchus, or the Malchus within Chesed, within Gvura, and so on. <clears throat> the Masois were led by God, Al Pi Hashem Yachma, Al Pi Hashem Yisu, so there was an extra power from above that took care of the Malchus level. What does that mean in practical terms? So Malchus sometimes refers to Dibur, speech, the expression and connection to another. The emotion of Malchus is dignity. Dignity is not something like an emotion like love you can work on. Dignity emerges when you do the right things, a person gets dig- it feels dignified. Malchus less lamagam klum. It doesn't have every, anything of its own. It gets its radiation, gets its powers from Zah, which is the six midas above it. So when it comes to the midbar, the Malchus, which is also the lowest level, like the Eretz, that was nullified, especially the negative part of it, because the midbar was also nochesot of akriv. It was filled with serpents and dangerous elements, but those were nullified by the clouds of glory. So basically, Malchus was taken care of once you refine the seven times six. When it comes to Svir Seme, we have to go into every nook and cranny and achieve that dignity and also the Dibur that Malchus represents in the connection to another. Whereas in the six times seven, Malchus, as I said, is carried through the Machshava, the thought of the six higher spheres. So that's a brief explanation. So Shem Mab is six times seven, similar to the Masais, because its role is to help us travel through the wilderness of our life, the darkness of our life, and when you have the six times seven, automatically the last step is elevated as well. So sometimes we need to refine the level of the moon, Malchus, and sometimes by refining the higher levels, automatically Malchus is also elevated. So you'll say, so why do we have seven? Why is it not six times six? Because you need to have Malchus. It needs to be part of the structure. At the end of the day, the spectrum of human emotions and the same with the divine attributes in Atzillus consists of that, those seven levels. The question is, when you're refining within the seven, whether you need every detail. More, expl- more explanation is in Lukut Teta, chapter Masse, on the chapter of Masse where he discusses this. As well as the Maimorim of the Mitla Rebbe, some and others that come after that explain further what the Alta Rebbe establishes. So what's the connection to Svira Seimer? So we already get the idea. Because it's all about the refinement of emotions. That's what Eimer is. And as such, so the Eimer is actually 49 days. So there, it's our work of refining it. We invoke the name of Shem Ma'ab six times seven. So there we have the Koyach, both Mamata Lamaila, from below our refinement and God's name, 42. That brings it down to Asus and Delayla, the power from above. Okay. So what is the significance of the few paragraphs we say after counting the Omer? Besides Anam Koyach, there's more prayers. There's Yehi Ratzin. Does just saying the prayer rectify a blemish in a particular combination of sfirot, of spheres, or do we actually have to do a physical action to refine a blemish in that sphere? Okay, let's spell it out. He Ratzin speaks about that we ask Hashem to purify the toxins of each particular sphere, like we said, chesed shabe chesed, gvura shabe chesed. Um, uh, then came Yisait Shabahid, Malchus Shabahid, where we're up to now, and moving into the into Yisod. So we say that each one of the seven times seven has its particular personality. You're concentrating and focusing on that aspect of it, and you're asking Hashem, please cl- cleanse us, purify us from any blemish, anything that any pollution that in some way co- compromised or injured or wounded that particular characteristic. So the prayer is meant to be to help, as I said before, invoking God helping us. But obviously anything you do in actual Aved is going to be a benefit. The minimal at least we pray and we try that Hashem will do it. But the more effort we make. So it would be like someone saying, I count the Omer, I focus on the seven times seven or whatever that particular emotion is. Do I have to do anything? Is it enough for me to just say it? Of course, if you did something that day, and actually in my book that I wrote, Spiritual Guide to Counting the Omer, if you haven't seen it, you could also check it out in the app, my Omer app, even though we're coming to the end of Omer. 
but still never too late. If you haven't counted, obviously, you have to not count with a blessing, but the concept of refinement is still there. So obviously, the key is not just saying it, but also refining. But that's like in anything. When you're daven, is it enough just to say the words? Is, just enough, is it enough to, to just say the words? Or you have to do something about it. Like in anything in life, the more you do, the more the possibility of bringing down the blessings and the powers above that help you actually correct that part of your life. So that's the brief answer. What, that, and the significance is exactly that. Like every prayer, has, tefillah has the power. It's coming from us. And we're asking God to help us in our work, a partnership. Okay, since we're already on the topic of Omer, so let us move to um, this question. Thank you for your weekly insights. My question is the following. Is it, if, if the correct way to count the Omer is by using the Hebrew word lo Omer, instead of the Ashkenazi term, the way they say it, bo Omer, so you say, Yem Echad La Omer, Yem Yem Echad La Omer, is the way the Alter Rebbe puts it in Siddur, in his Siddur, the way Chabad says it in some others. I'll quote some of the sources shortly. But there is La Omer, as the Ramah writes. Ashkenazim say, La, I'm sorry, Ba Omer. So then the person is asking, then how come the holiday is called Lag Ba Omer? Why is it not called Lag La Omer? Did the Rebbe ever discuss this seeming contradiction? Thank you in advance. Yeah, so there's actually an answer from the Rebbe exactly on this question. Not exactly the question. Someone writes about the different opinions, whether you say Bo'imer or La'imer, the Lamed or Beis. So someone writes to the Rebbe, isn't it seem as an absolute proof? Because we all say Lag Bo'imer. So there's a proof that we say Bo'imer, not La'imer. And the Rebbe responded four points he made, uh, three points. Harigamad Murazokan Yodam is Advarzeh. The Alter Rebbe also knew that. And yet, even though we say Lag Bo'imer, in the Siddur he writes Lo'imer. Point number two, the Rebbe refers to Lekut Esich as Chelik Beis. He actually wrote it out, page 553. So let's look what he says there. It's a Lag Bo'imer Sikh. Lekut Esich is volume two, page 553, the first footnote. It says Lag Bo'imer. So the Rebbe writes, Sarachim, we need to understand why sometimes, and also in Chassidus, it says Lag Bo'imer, even though the Nusra of the Alter Rebbe in the Siddur, and that's also our custom, is to say Lo'imer. And he says also in the Siddur, that this is also in the Siddur that the Baal Shem Tev David, he also said Lo'imer. And that's according to the Ariza, and the Rebbe brings that also the Ran, the end of Psochim, Shalash Shuvah Sarajba, section 126, Simon Kuv Chavov, Tanya Perek Sifnun, Perek Nun probably, Kolboy, maybe it means a different Tanya, maybe it means not our Tanya, maybe it means the Tanya Rapsi. Sifnun, Kolboy Sifnun, hey, Shaloh, Shari Tshuva, Chik Yankiv, Ve'id. These are all sources he brings there for saying Lo Oimer. And it's not a contradiction, whatever the reason is, because Alta Rebbe knew that as well, like he says in the first point. Finally, the Rebbe says one more thing. Besifre Pale and Muvo. In Sifri Pel, meaning Svarim from the Pelish Gdalim, from Poland, it's, it's brought that Lag Be'emer is Gematria and Gematria Moshe. Lag Be'emer, with a base, is Gematria Moshe. And the Rebbe brings a Lohoyer, that Rajbi was a Nitzutz, was a spark for Moshe. This is from the Emek Kamelach, famous Mukubal, from the students of the students of the Arizal. V'nesal le'esha er she'kibal Moshe kesha'al le'kabal luchish niyas that Ashbi elevated to that level of light that Moshe received when he went up on the mountain to receive the, receive the second tablets. That's a Eimek HaMelech, Samach Beis Dalad, Val Derech Zeh Bekam Mekemes. So you see, that may be the explanation why we say Be'emer, because it's a hint to the Gematria Moshe. You say Lag Be'emer. So the Rebbe did address it. Since we're talking about Lag Ba'emer, these, these have been the segues. Lag Ba'emer was last Thursday. There's been a follow-up, quite a few follow-up questions. So let me address a few Lag Ba'emer follow-ups. We're still obviously in the, you could say, I don't want to say shadow, but in the echoes 
in the presence of Lag Bahama that continues to affect us. So let's talk, follow up with a few questions. What is the significance to Hoid within Hoid being on Lag Bahama? So we know in the Sphiris, Lag Bahama is Hoid Sheba Hoid. Is there a connection to Rab Shimon by Yechai? Absolutely. And that, the answer to that is actually in Sidr Imdach. There's a Shar Lag Bahama there. Siddur Imdach is referring to the Siddur that the Mitla Rebbe published, where he gathered the discourse of his father, the Alter Rebbe, in the order of prayers, and also the order of holidays, and Shabbos and holidays, including Lag Bahamir. She explains because Rajbi's Inyan was utter bittel. Anos Ba'alma. All he was was a sign, signpost. He was just a channel for the divine in existence. Man Odin. Hashem Dorajbi, the Gemara says in Yerushalmi. She's a channel. The other bitl is, sim- is signified in by Hoyt Sheba Hoyt. Hoyt is bitl, acknowledgement, suspension of self, Hoyt. And Hoyt Sheba Hoyt is the bitl within bitl, the ultimate bitl. That's the level of Rajbi. And that's why he was unique in so many ways. Hoyt Sheba Hoyt is also splendor within splendor. Certain beauty, that's the beauty that comes out when you're able to be a channel for that higher levels of elikus. That's the brief answer as he explains there, the avoid of it, heidah, sheba heidah. The acknowledgement, the bitl within bitl. Okay. Next question. We are taught that Moshe Rabbeinu's burial site is secret because the people knew where it was. They were daven there. And that might have the unfortunate side effect of non-Jews making a shrine there and doing a Vedazara, which, we very, which would be very disrespectful. But if that's the case, why are we allowed to know where Rab Shimon Bayechoy is buried? Why are we allowed to know where the oil is? Okay. Especially since we just read from the Rebbe's note, from this, from Emek HaMelech, that Moshe and Rajbi have a connection. So I've not seen an answer for this question written anywhere. If anybody has something that has been written or spoken or the Rebbe speaks about or somewhere Exodus or other Svarim, please make me aware of it. Just submit it at, as I said, ChassidusApply.com and I'll share it with the public. But I would speculate the following, that once you have a Moshe Rabbeinu and there's a Moshe new generation that is on that level, you don't need afterwards to keep emphasizing that. We'll talk about the shrine in a moment. Because remember, there's deeper reasons. It's not just because it shouldn't be a shrine. Lo yoda Moshe, lo yoda was also because Moshe reached a level that was higher than awareness. And therefore, the level of Har Nevoi. He went up on Har Nevoi. Nevoi is the letters Nun Boy, as the Magid explains. That Moshe achieved the levels, the 49 levels, Memtesh Shari Bina, the 49 gates of understanding. But the 50th gate eluded him until that last moment when he went up on Har Nevoi. Nun Boy, the 50th is within it. So you see, even Moshe Rabbeinu is on a level that this Nun, Shara Nun, until the Osed Lovei, remains beyond our access, similar to what Hashem says to Moshe, no one can see me and live. But Moshe achieved it. But Moshe achieved it. The rest of us, it always has to remain a certain mystery, especially Moshe Rabbeinu. Min amayim mishisuyu. He came from a different reality. Al Tareb explains in, in Tayyar Shemais, he came from the first Shemitah, a very different spiritual realm, the realm of water that's concealed and hidden, al Kasya. So there are many things about Moshe that remain mysterious, including his, his oil. The other reasons given is more the practical reasons, or they evolve from that primary reason. So the truth is, every Moshe in every generation has an element of that. But once we have a Moshe that's in that place, it doesn't have to be done in every way. Remember, there's also the mile the other way around that we should have access. People going to the oil, for example, get strength from it. They daven. The Rebbe compared it once to Yosef. The Yaakov Avinu was asked, I'm sorry, Yaakov Avinu asked his children to make sure that he be buried in Mara Samach in Hebron and not leave him to possibly become a shrine by the, in Egypt. Yosef, why did Yosef not do the same? He would have been even more worshipped by the Egyptians because of his being a viceroy. So the Rebbe explains in famous Sikh of Ayechi, Tov Shemem Ches. Because Yosef's union is to remain in Biyah. 
Yaakov is Atzilus, that's Eretz Yisro, Chevron, together with Avram, Yitzhak, and the Imois, and Odom and Chava. Yesuf is to bring it into Mitzrayim, and to give Jews the strength that even when we're in Golis, I'm here with you. And just as I promised you, I took, you took an oath that you'll take me, Atzomis Yesuf, the bones of Yesuf, when you return to Eretz Yisro, after you leave this God-forsaken place, know that you will always know that I'm here with you and that promise will be kept. So it gave people the strength and the hope that we would finally get out of here. And the Rebbe said the same thing with Yesuf, Shebedereinu, the Friedrich Rebbe. Didn't ask to be taken to Eretz Yisro. The oil is here. So there's an Indian of the oil being among us. And that's the quality of when it's revealed. But Moshe Rabbein reminds us there's always an element of mystery. Even when you go to the oil and you see it, don't think you have it all figured out. There's always something that's beyond us. That would be my uh, hergish, if you wish, in explaining this idea. And the same with Rajbi. Remember, Rajbi comes from the secrets as well. Is Megala Seid Shabbatayr and Nishmosa that I said the secrets are mystical, esoteric teachings, but he revealed them. And like Bahim is a revelation day. So even though it still carries a mystery, we talked about it um, uh, last week uh, and other times. So yet, but he revealed it. He revealed it to his students. The greatest secrets he revealed on Lag Ba'im. Do we light bonfires on Lag Ba'im as, an, as a homage to Rab Shimon Ba'yechoi as it's thought that when he came out of the cave he was in such a high spiritual state that every, anything physically looked at caught on fire? Well, let's divide the question into two. Why do we light bonfires? And is one of the reasons that everything caught on fire? I would sub- suggest not. Because the caught it catching on fire, even though it came from his great spiritual level, but the Hashem did not like it. He said, no, you can't burn the world up. And he sent actually Rajbi back to the cave another year to come back in Bamitzvi year, a thir- 13th year. And now he came back that whatever he saw that needed repair, he corrected, he repaired. So I've not seen that reason, but there are other reasons. And since we're on it, let me just give a few reasons. The first place I believe where the idea of bonfires on Lag Be'emer comes from Rav, the Bartanura, famous Rav, the Rav, Reisha in Beis, the Rav, Rav, Rav um, Avadia Bartanura. This we're talking about is the 15th century. And he writes that, um, that when he went to Israel, he saw in Lag Be'emer they would gather and light large fires. I believe that's the first place. The few reasons given is, is one, um, Bnei Yisachar, or Bnei Yisachar, he writes that in order that that Lag Beimah, since being the Yemen Lul of Rajbi, the, the 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 bonfires, the torches, are meant to hint to the fact that it's that his light continues to shine, and since he revealed the hidden aspects of Torah, that that too should shine like a blazing fire. There's another explanation given. That the day, and this is explained in the Zoya, that the day Rajbi was nostalgic, the sun, the sunset was delayed until he finished revealing the secrets. And the Zoya uses the expression, a fire burned around them and the sun did not set. He revealed hidden Torah secrets of the, Kabo, of the Kabbalah until he reads the verse. And then, as the Zoya continues, that was his nostalgic. And the Bnei Yisrochah writes that this was to signify that all lights come really from the Torah. That's why the sun did not set. Another explanation given is that, um, that, that Rabbi Shem Bayechoi refers to the Torah as Butzina Kadisha, the holy candle. So that's the symbolism. Another explanation brought is that um, we're talking about the posik, the voice, um, the voice of the Lord cleaves with the flames of fire. So it's a posik, I believe it's in... Uh, Tehillim, yeah, Chavta Zayin. So what does he say there? So therefore that hints to the fact that when Nanhoit Shebehoid relates to the day of the flames of the fire connected to Rajbi. Another explanation is because Lag Be'em is 17 days before Matan Teir, 17 is Gematri Toiv. And Toiv is connected with Teir, Ne'er Mitzvah with Teir Er. So that's that connection. And finally, that the Zayar came to illuminate the light and the darkness of, of Golos. And that's the symbolism of the bonfires. So fine. That's several reasons given. There are not other, a number of others in Shabbat Yisachar and in the time of Menhagim and other places. Okay. Another person writes this 
Okay, this is a little painful, but I'll read it regardless. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, this is um, referring to briefly how do we address the despicable behavior, despicable behavior of some in Meran and Lag Bohemia this year. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, there is some very disturbing video coming from Iran and Lag Bohemia which shows Charedim riding at the cave of Rab Shimon Bayechoy and throwing rocks and garbage at the police. Have we not learned anything from the terrible accident that happened there last year? The police were there for crowd control in order to prevent any accidents. But some people think they are smarter than everyone else and could vandalize property in order to cut the line and sneak in and be first. What benefit can someone get from spending time in a holy place if they get there through improper ways? Someone needs to teach their acheres to these people. A mitzvah habav bavera doesn't count. That's a mitzvah that comes from a sin. Just as if, just as if someone stole money and gave zdaka or served pork at a seder. I wonder if the actions of these zealots are the cause for Mashiach not coming. If, certainly, if certain people feel they have the right to harm their fellow Jews by throwing dangerous projectiles and doing property damage in order to spend a few minutes by a holy caver, what could they be capable of doing when Mashiach comes and they want to cut the line to be first to greet Mashiach? Would they hit police officers with boulders in order to push their way in? What assurances do we have in Tanakh that when Mashiach comes, everyone will behave properly and be respectful and orderly? Because if there's no assurances, then I don't see any purpose or good for Mashiach coming. I'll add, God forbid. One of Rabbi Akiva's main teachings was doing damage to your fellow Jews in order to celebrate Lag Bayim is antithetical to Rabbi Akiva's message. We wouldn't tolerate someone bringing tray food into our shul's kitchen. Why do we tolerate bullies, bullies and zealots misbehaving at large gatherings and doing the opposite of Avis Yisrael? There should be zero tolerance for this behavior, bad behavior and there should be severe consequences for those who harm others by not following protocol and instructions from the police in order to maintain safety at a large event. There should be video surveillance cameras at all large events and anyone caught being disrespectful or doing something dangerous and, and, and illegal should be identified and arrested and spent 15 years doing hard labor in a maximum security prison. May Hashem help us and bless us that no such accidents like last year in Miran should ever happen again and may we have awareness campaigns in every community that remind people about Dera Cheretz respect, and may we learn from it and become better people and thereby deserve that Mashiach should come. So I read this full-length letter uh, the, because there are legitimate points. However, I need to say this. You know, in general, we stay away from trying to speak negatively about people, except when, of course, it can prevent a problem or be of tayelis, of benefit. I read it because this is a voice that a lot of people have. But I want to just amend something and make a very important statement here. If I had to address this topic, I would not speak in this tone because this tone itself is somewhat uh, inciting. And it, first of all, suggests a blanketly, blanket that everybody behaved disrespectfully, and that's not the case. Even though a few people can't spoil it for everybody, but I think it's important to remember that thousands and thousands of Jews with very good hearts and with respect and that are went to Miran this year, any year. The tragedy last year was terrible and uh, not in any way defending that we shouldn't have protocols and so on. But you have to also remember, Jews, look how they keep celebrating Hilula um, Darajbi, Simchashi Darajbi. And I think it's important to put that in context. When you read this, it appears almost like only besmirching and only talking about the negative. And that's why I wanted to qualify. Are there points here that are legitimate? Yes, and that's why I did read it. Um, and uh, we know that it's kod milateira. We know that it's a chil Hashem when anyone, especially a person doing something in Gedusha, behaves in a way that's not proper. But this is a sad reality, not just on Lag Be'emir, but other places and other situations. And we have to look at ourselves, not just point fingers at others. That everybody has a certain element of dissonance where you have faith and belief and so on. And at the same time, you can do something that goes, is antithetical and goes against the very spirit of Yiddishkeit, and so on. So if anything is learned from this, is obviously we have to do everything possible to make sure that people behave properly and expect and demand Kiddush Hashem. But to do that is usually not through reprimanding, but the opposite, elevating people and educating them. This idea about arresting people, putting them 15 years, I mean, is a little exaggerated, in my opinion. I think there has to be mostly through our own systems and chinuch, teaching 
that Yiddishkeit is about refinement. The Rambam says, Kol nitna lelasa shalom be'elam. Came to bring peace to the world. And not just peace, global peace, world peace. Also peace between ish ve'ishte, as he explains there, between a husband and wife, between parents and children, between community members. That's even in a regular situation, especially in a special day like Ve'emer, as you say accurately, that celebrates Aves Hashem, Aves Yisrael, and Aves and Aves Yisrael. Unity, the opposite of the Tamidi Rabbi Akiva that we learn from, who disrespected each other. So we have all these lessons, but it always should be in a positive tone. Now, obviously, in certain individual situations, you may need more discipline just to be, give the complete picture. But I just wanted to put it into that type of context. Okay. Talking about negative things, someone writes like this, and we should not know, I should repeat, we should also not know of anything that happened in Iran. May the families continue to be consoled. Horrible what happened, and, um, and only have brachas and simchas begoli, and we should all be reunited, re, be reunited with our loved ones, with the gula amitiz v'ashlema. Saying that, I want to also comment, chaz v'sholem, to say that, yes, it's true that sinas chinam is the cause of the destruction of the, of the temple, and therefore love is the key to bringing Mashiach, but to say Mashiach is going to come, and is not going to come because we'll behave this way, I think the opposite is true. We have to have a call of ref- total refinement and derecheretz and internalizing Yiddishkeit and Torah and mitzvahs internally in a way that we are more refined and, and be, make a keli for Mashiach to come. Now, even though, thank God, and there should be no more attacks, but someone wanted to address a topic about did the Rebbe ever explain why putting tefillin on can stop wars and terrorist attacks? Did the, yeah, and what exactly is it about seeing us wearing tefillin that frightens our enemy and makes them run away? Does this lesson from the Rebbe include we put on our tefillin at home or within the walls of a shul? Or do we have to wear tefillin in the streets and public so our enemies can actually see them in order to be afraid and run away? That's what the Pasuk says, that when the people will see the tefillin, they will see the tefillin, especially tefillin shalrosh, and they'll be like I just said, they'll see it and they'll be afraid. And we've seen many stories like that. Stories with Alter Rebbe, stories with Friedrich Rebbe, other stories through the generations. There's some zgula, some power of tefillin because it brings Hashem. And when someone sees godliness on a Jew, they some way, whether subconsciously or consciously, some way they, it causes them to retreat. That was why the Rebbe quoted it very strongly during the Six Day War and afterwards, that this is a zgula for protection. It's a posik. It's not, Kabbal, it's not some hidden Kabbalistic concept. It's a posik in the Teda. How to explain it? You can explain it by Gashmis, you can explain it by Ruchnis, or both. Sometimes you explain it because it looks like a weapon. Not a weapon, God forbid, a physical weapon, but you see something that they have. What is this mysterious film? But Baruch is for sure. It carries the names of Hashem, and that's what gives. Now, that does not mean you have to be in the street, even though Mifzit film is done sometimes in the street. No, it means the concept. Even a shul. And remember, even if an enemy does not see it directly, he may have seen a picture, he may know of it. But obviously, I guess, when you see Vero Kalam, it's to see it physically, just like Tzitzis, Vero Isames, I'm seeing it, I'm sure it has even a deeper effect. But I've never seen, I have to look whether it's actually, the effort has to be made that they actually see it. But in a time of war, God forbid, maybe that is, maybe that is something important, that they see it. They see the soldiers putting on fill in the morning and wonder, what is this that they're doing? I believe in the Six-Day War, there were stories where the tefillin did scare the enemy because they, were so, they saw like some secret weapon, as I mentioned. So, for sure, whenever there's Rahman al in any situation, and let's do this in a preventive way, that the Yodam in Mecca should come from the Rao Kalame audits of tefillin. Okay. There's some follow-up that I'd like to do. Let's see what we can do, cover right now. Let me do a few follow-ups. Since we have a few, more, a few more minutes in this program, we'll do follow-up. 
So abortion was in the news, so we spoke about it. So someone writes the following as a follow-up to what I spoke about two weeks ago. It's more of a request, the person writes. When I was a teenager, President Reagan was at some point trying to overturn Roe, Roe versus Wade. This is the Supreme Court ruling in 1973 uh, legalizing abortion as a constitutional right. Now it's been the news because it seems to possibly being become overturned. Me, being a firm girl, immediately was happy. This sounds in accordance with the, with the Torah. My father, however, explained to me why it wouldn't be a good law, I'll be Torah. There are reasons like the mother's life will be threatened. Now the mother has to be dying to have an abortion. If she lives through it, then the doctor goes to jail for murder because obviously she wasn't so sick. Fetal anomalies inco- in- incompatible with life. I'm attaching a link from an ob gen who goes through this very thoroughly. She also focuses a lot on the right of the mothers to decide about her body and probably some other things like that. But I'm linking it because she explains it well. Thank you very much for your lessons. Again, this is more of a comment to you than, rather than something you have to answer. Okay, look. I'll just repeat again what I said. We have a Torah. Whether the Constitution of the United States goes with Torah, not necessarily always. We have to, when we go from Torah, the Torah tells us the laws of generally speaking, that abortion is not acceptable and even prohibited. For all the reasons, doesn't always mean murder. In most cases, not as a matter of fact. But nevertheless, you're still aborting a part of uh, a human woman's, a woman's body in addition to the sanctity of life that we're, that's involved here. Now, obviously, this doesn't apply when there's pekuach nefesh to the mother, as we discussed. Whether the Roe versus Wade should be overturned or not is not necessarily a Torah question. What I mean by that is, it's a uh, legal question. If it's overturned, that doesn't mean that suddenly abortion is going to disappear in this country. So we still have all the issues that Torah has with it. If it goes back to the states. So I think it's important to distinguish between the two, and I just want to reiterate that. Another follow-up, another controversial topic, Yei Matzmut. So I discussed this again, I think two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I believe. How can a Jew not celebrate Yom Atzmut nowadays that we finally have a state of Israel which helps and gives every Jew who walks on the face of the earth the pride and freedom to exist without fear that someone like a Hitler will come after them? Shame on people who do not support Israel and its Independence Day. Those Israels, those Israelis give their life and, do, and, 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 so, we in the dias, and so, so that we in the diaspora can walk with our, with our heads straight and proud not like before the Holocaust. Well, the issue I would take with that is we all agree that there's miracles happening at Yisrael, but let's not forget God. God is the key that allowed that to happen. Yes, we thank those that were involved, and that's why we respect the government and respect its laws and pay, pay, pay taxes, and definitely the honor to the IDF and anyone that protects another life and the importance to be part of that process. But what we spoke about, this doesn't mean Eretz Yisrael did not begin in 1948. It began long, long ago, thousands of years ago. And that's a discussion. It's about not, minim- it's not minimizing. To give credence simply to Yemat Smut, as we discussed a few weeks ago, is limiting the power of Eretz Yisrael, not the opposite. So I think you're conflating two things. So to honor the fact that Eretz Yisrael exists and Jews have the ability to be protected and live there and all that, beautiful. This doesn't necessarily mean that everything that the government does or establishes necessarily has that same sanction. If you want to celebrate it, it's just so that God gave us thousands of years ago. And now we have the schus and the blessing to be able to return there and live there in peace. And with the growing Jewish population, preparing us for the gula by all means. Pesach Sheni. So this is something I spoke about again two weeks ago. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I hope it's not too late to ask a question about Pesach Sheni. See what I did there? Right? Because Pesach Sheni is about not, never too late. So, what we, so we always say that Pesach Sheni teaches us that it is never too late, and there's always a second chance. But is this really true? The Talmud says that a crooked thing that cannot be straightened refers to a man who cohabits with a woman forbidden to him and fathers a mamzer. Where is the second chance there? If someone murders someone, there ain't no second chance. If someone sexually abuses a child, it would be insidious to claim she should, she, should get, she should get a second chance. How many second chances should we give to a get refuser? 
a divorce refusal. I think we need to be careful to frame the idea of second chances in a sensitive manner rather than resort to cliches. All the best. So the truth is this question came in after the program I did last week, but clearly the person who wrote the question did not hear the program yet. Maybe now they did. So I directly addressed this. Not necessarily all these specific examples, but the fact is, is it really truly never too late when you see things that seem to be irreversible, as I've just cited? So I think, as I said then, I'll just repeat, repeat, tshuva, true tshuva ma'ava, that transforms the past, does not mean that something didn't happen. Someone is hurt, especially ben adam l'chavere, someone hurts another, or causes a damage that's irreversible. In any possible way, things like you said, So what do you mean by second chance? So second chance there could be for the person, they can do tshuva themselves. They can find ways to compensate. And then, of course, God has ways of transforming the situation that even the most negative can be turned to a positive, even in this situation. But that doesn't mean you suddenly change what happened. It just means it could be channeled, it could be transformed. Okay. Um, we spoke about Achrei and Gdeshim. Okay, what? Well, a few weeks ago in Pashas Achrei and Gdeshim, the previous Pashas Achrei and Gdeshim have listed many of the forbidden relations that God does not want the Yidden participating in. When learning these sections, I'm constantly reminded of certain images and things I've seen before on the internet in my past life that I've tried not to dwell on. How should one approach this issue? Thank you, Rabbi. Well, I think we just said it, the concept of tshuva. Yes, there are things that we may have experienced in the past that haunt us. The key thing to remember is to build a better future. We do tshuva on the past, regrets, remorse, but with the goal of building something, Kabbalah Teva Lahaba. To go a step deeper, the things we've learned from being hurt also teach us the danger of it, so you'll be more careful. And finally, there are things that people have done negatively that actually if they channel it right by helping others in that situation or understanding deeper what the challenge is and channeling it properly really has the power to transform. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I will say that it's doable. But the key is not just forgetting the past. It's hard to erase a memory. It's taking the memory and say, what can I do with it that will make other people's lives better, make my life better? That's the key, real transformation. And when you do that, that's when the healing truly comes powerful, where you actually redeem the past, not just erase it. We're going to stop here, even though there's some more things which I'll address next week, hopefully. So this has been My Life Because It's Applied, episode 403. I want to wish everyone the continuing end of the Svidus Amen as we come closer to Matan Teda. Next week will be a special Shavuos edition, because Shavuos will be two weeks from Sunday. So Mitzvah Shabbos will not be a program two weeks from now, but next week it will be. Everyone have a very blessed week. Ani Hashem Refecha, in a way of Lechatchil Le'osim Alecha, God heals in a way that prevents and preempts any negative things, and we should finally be Zeicha to the Gula Mitzvah Vashleim even before the end of the Sefirah Se'em, immediately and now. Be well. Bye-bye. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapply.com slash donate.